Seth Freeman, thanks so much for joining in. Uh, yeah. Great to have you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry okay. about the technical problem. No, no, completely fine, Seth. Uh, I mean, that, that happens to it's the best TV. of us. <laughs> but just, just trying to understand, Seth, there are two or three big stories here. Let's start off with Japan. And, 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 and you know, the, the surprise election outcome, some people call it a surprise. What's the impact, set of the same on, on monetary policy in Japan, the yen, and thereby any impact of the yen carry trade on other EM stocks? Well, we've been seeing the, the, the decline of the carry trade opportunity over the last, I don't know, six weeks or so. Mm. So it, th this sort of thing is very positive for, for emerging markets. Um, you know, long term, to the extent people were borrowing in Japan and investing in India, I, I don't know if that's really a thing. I, I don't know what the numbers are behind that. But, um, you know, we're, we're seeing a, a complete shift with uh, what's happened from just, you know, I was on with you what, a week ago, 10 days ago, after the, um, the U.S. rates went down and um, some policy announcements like we saw in China, for example, it really made the, the market there rock at 22%. So policy changes in Japan uh, are, are likely to have a, a much larger reaction than we would anticipate. Um, just specifically, Seth, on what Mr. Ishiba is expected to do. Uh, and let me come to the Bank of Japan action. Last we heard, Bank of Japan increases rates. This yen carry trade tsunami hits world markets. And then Bank of Japan and the, and the then government comes in and says, OK, OK, we're going to go slow. Is there a concern mm -hmm. that with the new prime minister coming in, this stance gets reversed and we could see aggressive rate hikes? What would be the impact thereof? Well, if there are aggressive rate hikes, that, that could be very disruptive to um, you know, hedge funds who have very complex uh, uh, trades in place. But I would be really shocked. Um, there, there are you know, political and, and even uh, cultural constraints on making major shifts within the Japanese market. So I, I would be pretty surprised if we're going to see major changes. OK, let's talk a bit about China, Seth. And what are the concerns uh, as far as Chinese economy goes? The PMI now factory data has come in negative, as was expected. But then a lot of moves being announced by China in quick succession. Is this giving some comfort? Well, look what happened to the market in, in just a few days in China. It pulled in a, a tremendous amount of, of money. And, um, you know, s suddenly investors, especially you know, hedge funds and, and shorter term traders are very excited about the, the Chinese market. However, the market's one thing. Um, the the uh, tight control by the pure Politburo and the, the basic fundamental political shift uh, risks and especially the, the terrible real estate industry there, that doesn't go away overnight. So I think that this is really a, uh, we're seeing movements based on pure opportunism, not necessarily long-term commitment. Okay. Uh, just trying to understand, Seth, uh, in slight more detail, one question. There's a big rally building up in metals, right? So my question to you is, can there be further upsides to base commodities and industrial commodities because of what China has done? Or is the global growth overhang going to hit uh, those prices because crude is certainly not lifting off even as base metals are. So what happens there? Well, you know, I think it really has to be more specific to which metals and the demand drivers for metals as opposed to broadly, you know, base. Yeah. So base which metals, metals do you expect a rally set? Let's put it that way. Well, you know, uh, co copper, copper is, is still hot after being kind of in the doldrums and um, you know, uh, zinc and some of these other metals that, that have been used a lot, lithium, is obviously not a base metal. Uh, for, for batteries, um, has subsided quite a bit. The, the issue in terms of some of these other base metals is related to infrastructure investment and construction and autos. So it kind of depends on, on how those particular industries are going to do. 
One last point, Seth, and you spoke broadly about the impact of what could happen in China impacting all or, you know, hitting all Asian markets. But the specific India view, uh, what is the specific India view emerging at this point? Because it's being looked at for now some time vis-a-vis -vis China. So even as China continues to contract, uh, how do you think the flows are going to be and the view is going to be on India? Well, I think those numbers you were showing for the, the aggregate numbers for September were, were pretty amazing. And what's most amazing that, that both domestic and international investors have to be observing is look at the number for domestic investors. You know, 10 or 15 years ago, this didn't exist like this. And foreign investment and money flows from foreign investors could just roil the Indian market. And the, the growth and the relative stability of domestic investors has completely changed Indian market dynamics. So yeah, you can see that fund flows are negative from foreign investors, but, but, but four times, three and a half, four times bigger by domestic investors. This didn't exist. And um, domestic investment is, is going to continue over the next decades. So um, for those reasons, I think that uh, you know, lower interest rates Continued problems in China are positive for India. Okay, thank you so much, Seth R. Freeman there, uh, talking about, uh, you know, what is the kind of impact we're going to be seeing. As far as India is concerned, well, the flows have been coming in and IPOs are moving them to a large extent. And uh, don't forget that you have big IPOs set up for the next few days. <laughs>